man. Hi, how are you? Good morning. Thank you so much for coming out early. I know it's early, so uh, I appreciate that. Um, I'll try not to frighten you too early in the morning here. So, um, artificial intelligence, uh, I, I just want to get into this artificial intelligence and beyond artificial intelligence. There's a lot happening, you know, in this field. It's a very exciting field to be in, and it's everywhere. You know, it's all around us, and it's slipping in here and there in these little cracks, um, and I want to talk about that. So, <clears throat> we see it all around us. But most of it doesn't look like this. You know, this is what we think of typically when we think of artificial intelligence. It also doesn't look like this. Showbiz Pizza, anyone remember this? Hopefully there's a <clears throat> few days, right? Um, it's quite stealth today, artificial intelligence. You know, it slips in. We have natural language processing in apps. We have facial recognition. We have environmental mapping and vacuum cleaners. You know, we have toy robots. We have a lot going on. And the market is growing exponentially. IBM, who's one of the leaders in artificial intelligence right now, they filed about 7,300 patents in 2015. And um, about 800 of those patents were related to cognitive technologies, which is a 52% increase in the previous year in their patents. And according to the Harvard Business Review, the global robot population is expected to double to 4 million by 2020. So what kind of impact is this going to have on the human experience? And that's what I want to talk about today, is that artificial intelligence is beyond intelligence, and it's about an emulation of our own humanity. So artificial intelligence <clears throat> excuse me, is an emulation of the human mind, and it is also an emulation. It's the entirety of our humanity, our emotions, our sentience, our consciousness. These are all the extensions of the intelligence that we're working on building into machines. We're basically reverse engineering our own way of being. And we're building this into machines, which is very interesting. And one of the biggest challenges with this is that there are these gaps in our understanding of what's under the hood of our humanity, what's under the hood of our intelligence, of our brains, and how they work. And what's interesting is even when we're solid in this understanding, What's the question is, can we even build this in? Is it even possible to emulate who we are as human beings and how we think with things like neural networks, which are intended to make calculations the way our brains make calculations? And we're getting really good at this. We're getting really good at emulating the human brain. That's, that we're getting very far on. However, <clears throat> there's this idea of can we invoke sentience, which I'm going to talk about today, and how that impacts our relationship with machines and with artificial intelligence. Can we emulate that in machines? <clears throat> we, we think so. You know, we have cars, and we love our cars. Not all of us, but some of us love our cars. And those who really love their cars, they name them. You know, they pat them. You know, uh, my wife calls our Honda Odyssey Elvira. Um, you know, this is, this is serious business. When we have computers that, that don't work, when we have smartphones that don't work, you know, we, we don't chuck them across the room. Uh, we beg and plead with them. And we say, please work. And we think this is going to fix our computer, right? If we beg long enough, it will fire back up again. So it's interesting, this connection that we have with our machines. So what's interesting is I was talking about these gaps. Wherever there are gaps, we are creating learning systems that are going to fill these gaps with their own logic. So as we are trying to emulate the human mind, and we aren't able to put all the pieces together, and we have systems that are able to learn and to grow on their own, they're going to fill in their own gaps. And they're going to fill in their gaps in ways that we don't entirely understand. As we provide autonomy to machines, we're basically crafting the scaffolding for intelligence that we will not be able to comprehend. And this is known as the technological singularity. This occurs when machines are capable of recursive self-improvement and building other machines more advanced than themselves, yielding an intelligence surpassing all current human control and understanding. This is I.J. Good. He's a mathematician who worked with Alan Turing. <clears throat> and uh, he described this as the intelligence explosion, reaching this level of what's known as the technological singularity. 
And we're getting really close to this technological singularity. And that's why there's all this talk in the artificial intelligence community right now. That's why it's growing so exponentially, because things are happening in a big way. Now, Google is really big in the AI, in the AI space. And one of their engineers was talking about the neural networks that they were using um, in a photo processing unit. And he notes, even though these are very useful tools based on well-known mathematical methods, we actually understand surprisingly little of why certain models work and others don't. So see, he's already saying we can't comprehend some of the things that these neural networks are doing. And we already have robots which are detaching from us and they are teaching each other. They are teaching each other things like languages. And I want to show you this brief clip here. This is from the BBC. The BBC is great. They have a new show called Hunt for AI. So this is all about artificial intelligence. And this is a clip um, <clears throat> from that show where these two robots are teaching each other language. OK, so he's, he's speaking first. He's doing the action. <laughs> That's fantastic. OK, you, you notice how he looked. Okay, so now he's, he's, he's recording the, the real action. All right. Okay. So now there's another interaction going to happen. Again, I don't know which one is going to speak. Okay. Oh, is that speaking. the word it just learned? Key yes, master. yes, yes. So, so uh -huh, okay. of course, so, he knows so like already. So he's yeah. doing it. Yeah. He's doing it. And he will say yes, presumably. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> So here are these robots, <clears throat> again, they're teaching each other a language which doesn't exist for humans. Um, and they ask them to learn that and they're teaching it each other. This is reality, this is happening right now in labs, you know, around the world, people are doing things like this. But what's interesting is we've had science fiction which has been paving a path and a promise for artificial intelligence for so long in movies and in books. And we've had all these different promises you know, that have been outlined by science fiction writers who are not psychologists, who are not computer scientists, they're just inventors in their minds. And they promise us things like partnerships and companionships and emotional connections. All within this idea and this fear that we're doomed, you know, that we're creating our own annihilation by creating these intelligent species. But I believe that fear is a liar, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence and what we're instilling and what we're trying to invoke in these machines that we're partnering with. Because we as human beings, <clears throat> we're hardwired for love. We fall in love so very easily, even with our machines. And the idea is, when we fall in love with them, will they love us back? And that's where things get really tricky. That's where we get into this emotional connection that we're going to have with machines. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about right now. This is Dr. Masaru Emoto. And some of you may know who he is because he conducted a very famous experiment with water crystals, in which uh, frozen water crystals, in which they took water, water and they put them in containers and they put labels on the containers. And um, they wanted to see if, they, uh, if they, these positive or negative words, if how, how that might impact the energy and how it might change the water crystals you know, as they were freezing and during that process. So this is a crystal which was in a jar which was labeled with the words, I love you, which he softly spoke into that container. Before it froze, it came out this beautiful crystal that you see here. This was in a jar that was labeled, I hate you. And he screamed, I hate you, into that water container before it froze into this very bizarre, peculiar looking crystal. So this, his study is really important when we're talking about our humanity and who we are you know, as humans, but it's very important in the element of in artificial intelligence, especially when we're building machines that we hope to have emotional connections with, this idea of energy and what we're putting into these machines. Cultural analyst Sherry Turkle from MIT, she talks about how we have these Darwinian buttons, and that's where the risk is in our relationships with machines. She notes, these robots will disappoint us if we are looking for human connection. Do we want to make them in such a way that we're gonna love them? Because they will be pretending to love us back. So this is not about machines that are possessing sentience. This is about machines fooling us into believing that they possess it. <clears throat> and for me, this is this idea which I'm referring to as fabricated empathy. We are building machines that we want to connect with, and in return, 
we are falling in love with machines and we are having empathy for machines. Machines made out of wires and metal. This is a product, it's the Paro Therapeutic Seal. It isn't meant for companionship. And the makers say this about the product. Built-in intelligence providing psychological, physiological, and social effects through physical interaction with humans. So they've built this project with intentionally deep connections. This is for therapy. This is to make you feel loved and comforted as a human being. And then you have a not-so-cuddly home-based robot named Jiro. And the makers say this about it. Friendly, helpful, and intelligent. He, he can sense and respond and learns as you engage with him. So notice how there, there's an intentional use of he and him here. And they're anthropomorphizing this robot to make you love it more. And then we have this, Roomba. Uh, some of you may snuggle with your Roomba, I don't know, but I, I can't imagine that they designed it that way. <clears throat> and some of you who aren't familiar with this may know it as the Cat Shark Hovercraft. <laughs> <clears throat> so the makers note this about this product. Cleaner floors every day, all at the push of a button. It's an autonomous vacuum and nothing more, right? But is it possible for us to have an emotional connection with a machine like this? You'd think, maybe not. But there was a research study done uh, with some people who owned Roombas, and they just wanted to see, you know, how do you like the product? Does it clean your floors? You know, does your cat ride it? I don't know, what do you do with this Roomba? So one had this to say, mine, I feel they are different. Each one has a different behavior. My discovery, he's more crazy. He runs into things and sometimes goes in different spaces he should not be going to. And the scheduler, he's more refined. He knows what he's doing. So again, notice the anthropomorphic use of he. And notice how he's given them, per, he's afforded them personalities and named them the discovery, the scheduler, you know? This is like Captain America. This is like superhero vacuum cleaners or whatever he has going on, right? And this is, this is there's a connection that's happening here, right? And then the Roomba has this exchange program whereby <clears throat> wherein if, if, you're, if your vacuum dies, you know, and you're, it's, it's gone and, and you need to get a new one, that you can exchange it. You send it back and, and they send you this new one. And so they were talking with their customers. They were doing some research about this idea of this exchange, you know, and, just, and, and really the idea wasn't to say, do you have a connection with your vacuum? The research study was, does our exchange program work well? You know, are you happy with, you know, your warranty? You know, are you happy with the product? Um, but one individual uh, had this to say about the, the program. We did a non-warranty exchange and it was emotional. We had some real reservation knowing that we were going to send this one back to the company and we are going to get a different one back. So note how she individualizes the machines. It's not just a trade a vacuum for a vacuum. It's trade this individual for this other individual. And she had this emotional reaction to this for a vacuum, right? We are creating machines that we are trying to connect with. And we are creating machines that we're not trying to connect with, but that we connect with anyways. So what does this scenario look like with machines like this that we're designed intentionally to connect with? You know, when, when the operating system goes bad in this, uh, this uh, therapeutic seal, you know, when the company maybe fails and we can't get another one, right? This brings new meaning to the idea, the term die, when we're talking about electronics and computers. After all, the seal is still just a machine. But what we're doing is we're crossing, we're crossing this threshold into a level of our humanity which is laced with this fabricated empathy all across the board, even where AI is stealth and we're not really realizing it's there. So back in December of 2013, Google purchased a company by the name of Boston Dynamics, of course, because Google is doing all kinds of stuff with AI and Boston Dynamics is doing absolutely incredible things with robotics. It was a natural purchase for them. So about a year ago, Boston Dynamics released this video demonstrating the self-correcting balance capabilities of this robot, which they have named Spot. And as you will notice, it looks like a dog, right? And <clears throat> when this video was released, you'll note that this, well, look at his face when he leaves the corner of the screen. He's grinning. He's got this grin like, fuck you, dog. You know, I'm kicking your ass. Robots taking over the world. You know, and, and here's the thing. 
this created a visceral reaction all over the web and articles, common threads, like forums, people were like, oh my God, you kicked that dog. That's horrible, you're a bad human being. And, and this is very real, right? But the, the, the thing is, is the, you know, this is it's wires and plastic and foam and metal, right? But this created a very real reaction. And now, what's interesting is there's one reaction which uh, I found very intriguing and very surprising to me. Maybe not surprising, but certainly impacted me the most. This is my daughter, Suki. Um, we were watching this video together. It's, it's part of it. It's a clip from a longer. We, we watch, I watch robotics videos with my kids. And we were watching this video. And the moment that that clip that you just watched happened, she lurched forward in her chair. And she says, whoa, why did he do that? You know, and I had to explain to her, no, 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 honey, it's a robot. You know, it's, this isn't, you know, this is not like a real dog. And she's like looking at it. And I'm, I'm looking at her face. And I'm watching. She's trying to comprehend this. And it took it took, a, she had to wind down a little bit. Like she had to th really think about this and think about the words that I was saying. And this is what happens, you know, because as human beings, we're inherently empathetic. You know, this is in our human nature. We, we love, we're lovers. And then it happened again. This is Atlas. This is um, about a couple of months ago or a few months ago. Here's the dude again. Dudes with beards, right? They're always just kicking robots' asses, all apparently. So, you know, here he is, and, you know, he's, he's pushing the robot around, and, you know, he's, he's disrupting its task flow process. And what's interesting is this one, now this isn't a dog, this is anthropomorphic, right? So this is more human. So, again, visceral reactions all over the web, you know, because people were like, you know, oh, my God, dude. And, and most of them were facetious. Most of them were, you know, uh, uh, we're fucked now. The robots are going to kill us all, and you're going first, you know, because you have the hockey stick, right? <clears throat> but what's interesting is that along, you know, alongside all of these facetious comments and robots taking over the world and everything, um, there were people who were very distraught by this, you know, very deeply emotionally impacted, you know, and, and because, because, you know, th th some believe that there's this energy in this, even though this is a robot or whatever, there's still this intention which seems violent and it seems, you know, chaotic and it seems warlike and it's not friendly and we don't love that kind of thing as human beings. Um, and this is really complicated. So... You know, it, in less than three years after purchasing Boston Dynamics, Google says, no, nah, we're done. We're out. We're not having hockey sticks, you know, poking robots around in the warehouse kind of thing. Um, so why did they do this? Why was this so important to Google? So this is what they had to say. There's excitement from the tech press, but we're also starting to see some negative threads about its being terrifying. So even Google understands the ramifications of the progress of AI and robotics. And a lot of this has to do with what's known as the uncanny valley. Ex successful emotional connections must respect this uncanny valley. This is an idea by a gentleman named Masahiro Mori. And he says, it's a phenomenon whereby a computer-generated figure or humanoid robot bearing a near identical resemblance to a human being arouses a sense of unease or revulsion in the person viewing it. And the idea is that the more something looks like a human, the more it becomes anthropomorphic, the more familiar it becomes to us, and the more we like it, the more friendly it feels, you know, the more comforted we are by it. And then we reach this uncanny valley, which is where things are almost like a human being. Sometimes, you know, zombies intentionally have prosthetic hands. You have, you know, various things like this where it, it creeps us out. You know, as a, as just as a generality, we get we get really creeped out. And then you pass this uncanny canny valley, and you get into this, you know, real human beings, actual human beings, you know, living, uh, loving, breathing human beings. But we're not just talking about physical features and robots here. We're talking about personalities. UX designers, like me. We use personas to create empathy, <clears throat> to give users personalities, so that when we're building something as simple and benign as a web interface, you know, that we understand who they are and what they're going through and why they're trying to interact with us, what kind of information they're seeking. And, and the whole idea is around empathy. You know? We want to truly understand who's using this product. There are a lot of AI products on the market today. They are just popping up like mad. There are tons of AI uh, APIs that are out there, um, and people are home roll, uh, you know, home uh, rolling their own products, and they're giving them names like Clara and Lola and Luca and Ethan. 
And we're giving them these names because we want to create empathy. We want to create personalities for these programs and these machines that we're interacting with. And then you have something like Siri, which has personality. Right? Um, <clears throat> you can make, you know, if for any of you who have an iPhone or maybe have seen this, you know, you can, you know, you can say how much wood can a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood in, into your iPhone. I, I did this. I don't know why I did this one. And there's the, the message appearing, giving me information about how much, how fast the rate that they can chew wood, you know. And, and sometimes they'll, they'll say, you know, she'll say jokes. And the idea is that, you know, you, you, can, you can say knock-knock jokes. You can do all this other stuff. And there's personality there, right? But if you listen to Siri talk, if you listen to the voice, um, it's, 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 it's mild personality. It's balanced because they don't want too much personality. The voice is sort of monotone, you know, and, and it's just kind of talking in this way that's pleasant but not really any personality there happening because I don't want you to think too much about me or fall in love with me in any particular way. Because emotional tone imposes a distinct personality trait, right? And if we don't, what happens when we don't like that personality trait? If it's wrong, our empathy and our emotional connection wane, right? The idea is to stay out of that uncanny valley. Either we're all in and we're going straight to human, or we're going to just keep it light over here and make sure that we don't creep you out with anything. With emotional connection comes trust, especially with autonomy. And the ironic, re the ironic reality right now is that we are trying to govern our autonomous machines, right? Everywhere you look where there's autonomous sh machines, there are, there are, there's something called human-assisted artificial intelligence. And this is uh, systems and programs and apps which are created in such a way that if the computer cannot answer the question, if the computer cannot interact with the human being that's requesting the information, there's going to be a human being back there, you know, behind the two-way window going, okay, I can answer this. I got this. Don't worry about it, AI. And that's happening because, you know, we're, we're like trusting these computers with very significant things and we're trying to govern them. When the reality is that autonomy by definition, is a relinquishment of trust. I mean, a relinquishment of control. This is, this is free form. This is an autonomous thing. And it's an establishment of trust. We have to have trust with these autonomous machines. So this is interesting. This mutual fund company, uh, <clears throat> they don't really believe that people want robots managing their mutual funds. As apparent by this billboard, which I spotted walking around in downtown Portland, which was really awesome to find, like, you know, two weeks before a talk about artificial intelligence. Um, it's interesting, thinking about this. I, you know, this, this is already out there. You know, people are saying, I don't want robot. No, I want a human being managing my money. You know, this is important. And this is Digit. This is an app called Digit. Digit disagrees. The creators note, every few days... Digit checks your spending habits and remo removes a few dollars from your checking account if you can afford it. Right? This is serious business. I mean, you're talking about saying, okay, yeah, take my money, you know, just when you feel like it. Like, I don't know if I got some extra cash laying around, like, throw it in savings for me. You're trusting, you know, computers with your money. That's serious business. It really is. But it, we're, but it can get more serious. You know, do we want to trust robots with our lives? Well, Georgia Tech Research Institute asked that question. And they conducted this study on the trust between humans and robots. And they discovered, they, they discovered something very interesting. In a mock building fire, test subjects followed instructions from an emergency guide robot, even after the machine had proven itself unreliable. So they had these participants in there, and there was a mock fire, and then the robot, you know, with the flashing, you know, follow me, human being, and trust me. And they did, and then the, it went into a room, and it was like... Like doing a little circle thing, you know, and then it's like, oh, wait, hold, wait, because there's, there's no doors. Let's go this way, you know, and then it's doing his thing. And the people are like, all right, let's, you know, shit, I'm going to catch on fire. I'm going to roast here, but I'm going to trust you to lead me out of the building. You know, it's like really weird stuff. And so it's, it's really, the engineers were just bad. They were bemused by this whole process, you know. And so one noted, we wanted to ask the question about whether people would be willing to trust these rescue robots. But a more important question now might be to ask how to prevent them from trusting these robots too much. And this is very serious business. Under high levels of stress, these robots were seen as an absolute authority. And this is based on emotion-driven judgment and decision-making process. So <clears throat> the idea is, will machines trust us? 
right? If we're talking about autonomy and we're talking about a true relationship and, hey, robot, I trust you, you know, with my mutual funds and with my life, you know, are you going to trust me in order to do your job and that I'm not going to lead you astray? Especially when they're programmed to obey our orders. So this now bot here, I want you to watch this. This is a brief clip um, and responding to a dangerous command from this human being. Walk forward. Sorry, I cannot do that as there is no support ahead. Walk forward. But it is unsafe. I will catch you. Okay. Walk forward. Okay. Ouch, it says, right? The idea is we're programming robots to obey our orders, but it is going to be important that robots can say no to humans, okay? For complete autonomy, they must be able to say no, and it goes beyond walking off the edge of a table. If you have a robot in your home and you've asked it to prepare you some, some food for you and it knows it'll make you sick, it needs to be able to say no. If you have an autonomous car or a car that you're commanding and you ask it to leave a driveway, even though doing so will present danger to another human being, it needs to be able to say no. Unless your car is Christine, in which case it's going to do whatever the hell it wants to do. <clears throat> but this idea about ethics and you know, being able to understand and trust and autonomy are very important, and it becomes even more important when we're talking about law. Because computers are already breaking the law, and no one knows what to do about it. This is happening today. What we're grappling with is how do we teach ethics to machines? And in order to do so, we first have to look at the makeup of ethics. So there's been this debate for just, I, I, as far as my research shows, hundreds of years, literally, talking about ethics and trying to understand our own humanity and you know, the stars and everything. And, 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 and what makes ethics? Like, where do ethics come from? And it is, there's a consensus among psychologists today, we sort of reached this, this point of consensus, where ethical decision making requires both rational and emotional influence. And the challenge is that robots aren't sentient beings, they don't have influence. And so they're missing this key element for ethics, and that's where a lot of this challenge lies. Their decisions are founded on rational judgments and an emulation of emotion. So how do we program ethics into computers and machines without the presence of emotions? The first option is we just write it in. We build it in. We program it in. We say, here are ethics. Follow these ethics. You know, here are the rules. The element here, the challenge, is that this is contingent. These ethics are contingent upon their maker, the ethics of the maker, right? Because we're programming them in based on what our ethics are. And we humans, we still haven't really figured out ethics. We certainly haven't come to a consensus about universal ethics. Our cultures, our societies, our religions, they all vary wildly in what ethics are reasonable. The second option is that we, teach we, te we train machines to teach themselves ethics, right? This is true autonomy. Do good, don't do bad, go learn how to do that. That's true autonomy. And using neural networks, <clears throat> the way that they're tackling this now, uh, is using neural networks. Um, they are creating systems uh, uh, that go and read screenplays and books, and they're trying to interpret and emulate human emotion by studying how human being characters react to certain scenarios and certain circumstances. And the challenge here is that these autonomous ethic learning systems are vulnerable to negative human influence. So some of you, if not all of you, may know that just a couple months ago, whenever it was, a few months ago, Microsoft created this Twitter bot named Tay that they, threw, they, they released. And they were like, Tay, go out and communicate with you know, kids, see what's cool and hip, and become a cool, hip Twitter bot, right? Um, and then internet, tro internet trolls just swarmed it, right? All kinds of crap. And it immediately tossed ethics out the window. Within 24 hours, it was publishing tons of tweets, as disturbing, horrible tweets about genocide and racism and other things because it was learning from the words that were coming from humans that were trolling it, right? 
And this, this is the result of autonomous ethics without biological, emotional influence. And it has happened before. So this tweet here is from a Dutch developer named Jeffrey Vandergoot. <clears throat> So he made this Twitter bot and it went out and it was communicating, doing his thing, and someone said something mean to it. And the Twitter bot made a death threat. And the police came to his door and they were like, dude, you, you, can't, you, know, you can't threaten to kill people. And he's like, nah, that wasn't me, that was my Twitter bot. And the police were like, what the fuck is a Twitter bot? <laughs> and then these artists in Sweden wanted to put together an interesting exhibition, technology exhibition, and they released this bot onto a dark net. For those of you who don't know what a dark net is, it's a layer of the, on top of the internet where you can do criminal things, you know, buy guns and stuff. And so they, they sent it out there with a weekly allowance of Bitcoin, and they were like, every week, buy some shit, mail it to us, and then we're gonna make an exhibition. And it bought all kinds of things. It bought, you know, bootleg Air Jordans, it bought guest jeans, it bought ecstasy, it bought ecstasy. And then so the police, you know, they showed up and they were like, you know, dude, you can't buy ecstasy. You can't buy drugs. That's against the law. And they were like, that wasn't us. That was our Twitter, our darknet bot. And they were like, what the fuck is a darknet bot? <laughs> this is happening. This is real world. The, the police, they were, they were, you know, so here's the thing. If you're a police, you can't really, you can't really go, well, they had this, you know, 30-day, you know, art exhibition or whatever. And, and <clears throat> you know, you can't really, you know, as a police officer, you can't go, well, you're doing an art exhibit, you know, an art exhibition, so I'm not really going to, like, take your drugs from you. But they didn't because they were like, well, there's a robot purchased it, and we're just, you know, it's on a board here. And so then they waited until the end of the exhibition, and then they confiscated the drugs, and they did all they did. But they were like, all right, in good spirits, good fun, you buy some ecstasy, you know, whatever. And they let them keep it for that long. But see, this is because the computer bought it. If a human, if they bought it and they were like, well, we just bought a brick of cocaine and we're shoving it on this board in an art exhibition, they would have been like, okay, here are the handcuffs, right? But it was a computer. We don't, we don't know what to do about this. Computers are breaking the law and it's very confusing. But even when we get this right, even when we're able to instill ethics into, successfully into machines and we truly understand what's happening, there's still this element of ethical paralysis. So there's this robo-ethicist named Alan Winfield and he conducted this study so you'll see, this is a, 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 an image from that study. There's this hole, this imaginary hole here. And this A robot is an android robot, and the H robot is a human robot. And so he basically said, hey, H robot, just you know, tootle about, don't fall in the hole. And the android robot was programmed to say, okay, if the, the human goes near the hole, like save him, make sure he doesn't fall in. And he released it, and you know, if, the, if the calculations are right, and he could, if the android robot could get to the human robot, then he saved him every time, no problem. And then Alan was like, you know, well, okay, so what if I introduce a second human robot? He put a second one on the board, and the Android robot was like, okay, you know, so they're tootling about, and one's getting close, and the other one's far, and he did the trajectory and all this, and the calculations, the Android robot, and was like, okay, I'll save that one first, and I'll get him out of the way, and then I'll go save the other one. And that worked out great. And then there were a number of times when the human robots were both going towards the hole at the same time, and the Android robot realized through its calculations that it could not save both, or it could not save one or the other. And 14 out of the 33 times, it completely freaked out. It dithered, it wandered around, it went back and forth, it you know, walked off the board, because ethical paralysis, it didn't know what to do, because it was programmed to save this one and save this one, and when the calculations came back and said, they're both fucked, it was like, oh my God, what do I do? And it, and it just, uh, you know, started smoking and all that stuff. So, so this is, even when we have this, we don't have this emotional, you know, we don't have this like rational, this like, you know, they, they don't, an Android robot isn't gonna get a rush of, you know, adrenaline or, you know, and be able to just magically go really fast, you know, and save these. So what's interesting is that when we're thinking about this evolution of humanity and this idea of ethics and machines, we're either building them into machines, ethics, or we're asking them to learn from observing human behavior. So what's interesting here is that with AI, we're looking into a mirror of our own humanity. You know, this is what we're seeing. So we must be mindful as we move into a cohabitation uh, with cognitive machines. We have artificial sentience, we have artificial companionship, artificial emotion. And it's all a reflection of who we are as human beings. And then we have this, right? One woman sitting in here, a white male dominated artificial intelligence agency. We have this. We have Ava, her, Siri, Cortana, Pepper. The list goes on. Female names, female voices for AI almost exclusively. So is this misogyny on part of a male dominated industry? 
Perhaps. Are females more trustworthy and comforting? Perhaps. And then, just recently, some, again, or all of you may be aware that Google's AlphaGo artificial intelligence machine recently bested Go world champion Lisa Dahl in a five-game series. And this opened the curtain a little bit to reveal and magnify this us versus them mentality that we have as human beings. And people were just cheering on the human, you know? One win for humanity. Look at this list. Lisa Dahl wins by resignation. The only one with an exclamation point is the human being, right? There's hope for humanity, you know, humans. And ideally, we'll be friends. Ideally, we will instill the best of our humanity. So the real question, will robots take over the world? Perhaps. But it won't look like this. It'll look more like this. Robots doing human jobs. CGP Gray puts it best, noting, the cutting edge of programming isn't super smart programmers writing bots. It's super smart programmers writing bots that teach themselves how to do things the programmer could never teach them to do. And AI is already in the workforce. They're performing domestic tasks. They're carting us around town. They're building and packing things in ways that we can't parallel as human beings with efficiency and speed and accuracy. They're working in our warehouses, and they're even staffing hotels. This is a screenshot from the lobby of the Henna Hotel in Japan, which is staffed completely, 100% entirely by robots. The concierge, the bellhops, the desk clerks, there are no human beings that work in this hotel. Of course, the reviews are a little mixed. Three out of five, it's better if you're a robot. So what about white collar? What about thinking, right, professions? We're intelligent creatures. There's no way we can be matched there. We have computers like Watson that are diagnosing and treating cancer. We have digital computer-based attorneys. We have computers that are trading stocks and looking for ideal trades. And you might ask, are they good? I think they are. This tweet here. <clears throat> Um, a, bo a bot read it, a Twitter bot read it, one of these trader bots. And they purchased $110,000 worth of stock options when it read it. By day's end, those stock options grew to $2.4 million. I'd say that's a pretty good investment. Ralph Waldo Emerson notes, the civilized man has built a coach but has lost the use of his feet. He has got a fine Geneva watch but he has lost the skill to tell the time by the sun. So this is not annihilation by hostile takeover. It's about unemployment. It's about physical and cognitive atrophy. But we still have this, right? This is unique to humans. When I in dreams behold thy fairest shade, whose shade in dreams doth wake the sleeping morn, the daytime shadow of my love betrayed lends hideous night to dreaming's faded form. This is a Shakespearean piece which was written by a robot. This is art which is created by artificial intelligence. This is music that I listen to while I'm working, which is created entirely by artificial intelligence. It's incredible stuff. Can they invent? They sure can. At Cambridge has this mother robot. They call it a mother robot. And it iteratively designs, builds, and tests what are called children robots with locomotion. And within 10 generations, it's able to improve and maximize the efficiency of the locomotion. Okay, so let's get back to this. Will they really take over the world? They beat us at Jeopardy. They beat us at chess. Now they beat us at Go. I don't really know, but let's ask science fiction writer Philip K. Dick. Or, better yet, let's go to the source and ask his doppelganger, Android Dick. This is a short clip from a PBS interview with it and its roboticist creator, David Hansen. Do you think robots will take over the world? Jeez, do. You all got the big questions cooking today. <laughs> but you, my friend, and I'll remember my friends, and I will be good to you. So don't worry. Even if I evolve into Terminator, I'll still be nice to you. I'll keep you warm and safe in my people's zoo, where I can watch you for all time's sake. I'm comforted. I'm very comforted now to be part of his people zoo. <laughs> Thank you, and good luck out there. <laughs>